which uses a dynamic environment, basically all we have to do is flatten that list of pairs into a list of sums, um, which is pretty straightforward. You're essentially just breaking apart that structure and just injecting them into the list. So that's not too bad. Going the other way, well, we've got a list of sums, and now I have to make it into a list of pairs. That's not so obvious. How would you do that? Because, like we saw before, there, you could have continuation, prompt, prompt, continuation, continue. There's no way to necessarily put them back together. So the key trick is to reserve one of those dynamic continuation variables for a special purpose. That purpose is returning a value to the next continuation on the stack. So we can call it whatever, it doesn't matter. Here it's called TP for the next top level continuation. Um, so to return a value, just send it to whatever TP is at the moment. And the empty continuation is implemented by returning to that TP. So to transform that mark stack, that list of sums into the list of pairs, Every continuation that we had, which holds some non-trivial computation that's left to be done, gets associated with TP. We don't want to lose it. That's the next place we return to. And on the other hand, prompts are associated with our empty continuation, something that doesn't really do anything important, just tells us, oh, go to the next thing. And so now we've got an embedding in the other way, just by doing that. Um, so yeah, the main thing is when you hit a prompt, you just want to skip over everything until I get a continuation. That's exactly what the empty continuation does. And then uh, when I want to return, you just ask for TP. And so here we get a way to bridge those two styles of control operators. So an embedding from the monadic framework into the lambda mu based approach, which uses shift zero as the uh, core abstraction. And so if you're using multiple prompts, shift zero and reset zero styles of control. So the uh, the, uh, what was it, minus F plus style of control is the same as control zero and prompt zero, so minus F minus. So those two that we saw were different and hard to align. Actually, you've got the embedding by using multiple prompts. And as a corollary, if you're only interested in delimited control without multiple prompts, you can use two of them to do the simulation. So shift and reset with two prompts, it's the same as control and prompt. Um, there's a little bit more, uh, but we can open up for questions now if there is some. Are there any questions? Yes. Um, I was actually quite surprised that the embedding you did, like, yeah. there's no types anywhere. You just program the continuation. <laughs> Which, oh, oh, in what sense there's no types? Uh, uh, well, I mean, the, the, oh. the, the embedding you did was not like type directed. No, no, it's not type directed. No, yeah, not at all. It's it's a very untyped embedding. Yeah. But is it type preserving? Um, if, you're, if you did have types, I mean, it's a good question. So there's there there is a type system for the monadic framework. Um, there isn't a type system for the other one really. So uh, wait, wait, I thought lambda mu did have a type system. Well, yeah, lambda mu does, but then with the extension. Okay. Yeah. That one, there, there hasn't been a type system worked out for that. So probably type preserving. It's not obviously non-type preserving, but uh, it would require reflecting the monadic framework style of, of type system over to the other framework. Okay. Anything else? We can. Yeah. yeah. Looks like you have four more slides. But four more slides. It's okay. So this is this is the. Uh, so the semantics of what it looks like. So basically, the effect of that embedding is that you have the prompt, which is the delimiter you care about, but you also have another one, which is the traces of the composition. When you want to plug in two contexts nakedly, um, that's the whole thing that, that uh, operators like shift and reset avoid. You always compose contexts with a delimiter in between them. So this is where the key of having two matters. So essentially, the one delimiter is going to be what stops our control operator. The other one, we're always going to ignore. So it's effectively invisible and doesn't really matter. And so the rule for the F style of control, essentially we go up to that prompt 
And then when we evaluate the body, there's that sort of uh, trace left when we compose. And the same for its continuation. So here's the key. The continuation has to contain a reset or a delimiter. It's just one we don't care about. And sort of that's the, the essence of the embedding. And it's a mess, but in the end, it's just an example showing that that semantics really does behave like F, up to the extra resets that don't matter. And in the end, we end up with the list reverse as we had before. Right. Any further questions? Yes. Yes. So, so dynamic control variables are, are more expressive than static control variables. Uh, yes. Static so, control. so without but the uh, the yeah. problem is that uh, so reasoning is significantly more difficult than static mm -hmm. con continuation. Okay. So, I mean, but if I, you I think if you just have one uh, dynamic continuation variable to the uh, lambda mu calculus, you end up with shift and reset. So, it's no harder than shift and reset is. Do you think uh, control and prompt, control and prompt uh, are e well, equally expressive as shift and reset? Um, is control and prompt equally as expressive? Is that the question? Yeah, but I don't think so. Um, they're slightly different. It depends on what you mean by expressive. Um, which is a, sort of, we'd have to figure out what is expressivity. Um, yeah, yeah. In a very operational sense of can you write a program that will get the right result eventually, yeah. But, um, so there's, there's previous work by uh, Shen who, who does yeah, these embeddings yeah. and so yeah, in that Using recursive types. types. Hmm? Yeah, using recursive yeah. types. Uh, and my question is that yeah. uh, is reasoning about uh, programs with dynamic con con control operators? Uh, oh, dynamic control yeah. operators? Mm. Yeah. Easy or harder? <laughs> that's, I think that's why, in theory, we focus on the other ones because they're a lot easier than doing control and prompt. It's, it's harder, in theory, to really work out and prove yeah, other things. So, any other questions? Okay, then let's thank the speaker. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Oh, can I his experience in industry and uh, some motivation. It's not going to be, probably. it's going to be pretty theoretical, but apply. Um, <laughs> <laughs> two great flavors that are better together. Um, so when I originally submitted the abstract for the talk, it was just going to be me talking about um, an ongoing project I've been working on for the past two years, trying to build a better statically typed array computation library. Um, while working on the slides for this talk and trying to figure out how do I explain uh, performance engineering to type th theory people. Um, I kind of figured out a really nice way of explaining how I designed my library in a way that I hope some of you can reuse in some of your own problems. Um, so performance matters. You're not going to use an iPhone app that has pushing a button take 50 times longer than you'd like it to. You're okay with it crashing sometimes probably, but there's a lot of applications games, servers, numerical computing, where performance is actually matters operationally. Um, and when your program is really slow, your, your program, when you look at the code, doesn't really tell you, oh, this is the part that might be slow. Your profiling tools tell you that, but it doesn't tell you why it might be slow or why someone else's code is fast. And people spend a lot of time trying to figure out, why is this really slow? Um, and that sucks. I want to be, I mean, for me, I want to build libraries where the expert user's code is something that a new person can learn from. And where I can go cargo cult copy that, but understand, tease out the performance engineering elements from the math so I can adapt it to my own domain. 
Um, and, you know, it's not okay to say, oh, you have to learn how assembly is interpreted by this microarchitecture just to tease out some bigger, high level ideas that get you nearly to that point. Um, so, I mean, I kind of mentioned this already, but there's a lot of problem domains where latency and throughput matter, and if you don't have them, your program is wrong. Um, and in some respects, debugging imperative programs is a lot easier than debugging performance problems. I only have that one IORF. If I do it in the wrong order, there's only one reason why, that I didn't do the right locking logic and I need to think about it more. If my program's slow, I don't know why it's slow, I know where it might be slow, but I don't really have any explanatory power built into the tools I'm writing or using. Um, I have to go look at how OpenGL might be interpreted by the graphics card I'm using, or how me the memory, RAM, and cache hierarchy are tuned for that machine, and that's out-of-band information. For debugging my multi-threaded stuff, you know, I can just use in-band structure, um, you know, etc. So here's sort of a semi-algorithm that you can use that sort of is how I kind of derive. I can retrospectively derive a lot of my array ideas from. Um, for any given problem, you usually have some good rules of thumb of that are, if you follow this rule, it won't make your code slower. And, you know, it might be, uh, don't allocate memory you're not going to use, or, you know, or don't retain memory you're not keeping in the case of a garbage collected language. Or, uh, you know, don't send stuff over the network if you can compute it, compute it locally. And, have a tighter bound on when you compute it. So you write down, a, a, and, and I'll, I'll get to it, I'll walk the rest of the talk after I walk through the slide is going to be me sketching out how I use the, this, these ideas for designing my array API. So you have a bunch of domain specific rules of thumb, that's step one. You have to have those if you want to be able to reason about your code. And a lot of these are usually some folklore ideas that you know people in a given problem domain have about good ways of structuring the software. Um, now you sort of say, okay, for whatever my primary object is in my domain, whether it's arrays or network connections, I try and define an abstract interpretation of those objects that reflects into a lattice that gives me this information. Whether, you know, am I computing it locally or sending it over net the network might be a simple two-point lattice. Or, you know, memory locality for arrays, which I'll be talking about soon. But the point is you have that interpretation for your domain object. Then you sort of write down operations you care about doing, and you say, okay, when do I have unexpected performance characteristics on what inputs, where I have this nice general operation that people like to use. Um, so the way I've kind of been describing that is, that's kind of saying when you're write, writing a little, you're right by hand writing a little abstract interpreter for your domain operations, and saying, okay, when when do they give different levels of performance according to my little lattice approximation. Um, because when you're using a library, you don't really like to discover, oh, if I pass it this kind of matrix, it'll do a deep copy, but otherwise it'll just do an in-place operation. Uh, these sorts of things occur silently in a lot of end-user application libraries that you use or someone else or you wrote, and it sucks when you have to discover that there's corner cases that are not reflected in the interfaces you're using. Uh, especially since a lot of the common cases don't have the, this problem. So you could just have normal, the special case operations that don't have that sort of issue. And then a more general one that sort of, in general, just doesn't give good performance guarantees, and you put the warning on the tin. So the way to repeat that differently, you write this little path sensitive, as in like what are the internal branches of control flow in your operations, and you sort of split them up so that those branches are different operations at least for the spe common special cases. Um, so you just do that recursively until you say, fuck it, I have enough detail in my operations. I can put the warning on the tin for this more general one that I don't want people to use as much because I can't guarantee anything. OK, so let's talk about this with a, some simple examples in array computation. Uh, arrays, so arrays are kind of, we kind of a, a good stick figure model of arrays is you have a buffer and a way of translating some x, y coordinate into an into array offset. This isn't quite precise in general, but it's a good model. Um, so what's my cost model? Sequential scans over contiguous pieces of memory, you know, for ignoring 
the complex because we're ignoring the complexities of precise ways that memory actually works on computers are bet are the best. You know, doing strided uh, accesses in memory, hierarchical or not, aren't quite as good, but they're okay. And random access sucks. Just just don't do it unless you really have to. Um, so how do, how do we use that? Well, what's what's my lattice? Well, I can talk of, I, I, again, so I'm reflecting this information about these rules of thumb into some information I can associate with every array I'm working on. Well, I can talk about what is the, and using, I have this mapping from my xy coordinates to positions in, our, in some flat memory buffer. Well, I should be, if I can say my underlying memory buffer is contiguous and I can read and write to all of those, then there's some ordering where I just sequentially scan through memory uh, in a plus one structure, intercontiguous, which comes up in sort of a, nat which is a funny thing to define, but makes sense once you start talking about 2D arrays, and I can explain that out of band if anyone ever cares. Um, and what's going on there is you're saying you have these runs of like packed, packed arrays with gaps between them, but you can still sort of do some sort of structured scanning. Um, and then stride, which is, you know, you're working on, um, on just, you, you have your, 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 your small stride, if you're doing an in-order scan through this buffer object, is going to be something greater than one. And that ties, and so, let's, so, this captures basic properties of how cache lines on modern CPUs work. Uh, it ignores stuff about the hierarchical structure of modern memory, but it captures some basic rules there. So let, let's talk through matrix slicing. So I imagine some people here have taken an array computation class or messed with an array library, um, including some people here who have written them. Um, and so there's several different operations you want to do. You want to be able to project and pick out a sub matrix. You want to um, slice out a, a sub-matrix. You want to take a 3D array and then pick a 2D array out of it. That comes up in sort of things like medical imaging or certain types of geometric time series computations. Um, and sort of, oh, I didn't finish that word. Uh, <laughs> so, okay, so basically the idea is, the next slide, I'll walk through what these different slice things mean visually. Yes? Oh, what about tiling in your, in your lattice? Oh, uh, that's out of scope of the talk, but I do have a really cool story about that in reality. Okay. <laughs> um, I can talk, and I could, it, depending on how much time at the end, I can sort of walk through like the actual haddocks of my library, which cool. has a lot more interesting things. I'm not sure if we'll have that time. We might have a teeny bit, but you'll wind up being more confused if I show that with that, unless. We ha unless we have too much time. Okay, so the, but to recap, you kind of have the idea that there be, with slicing, it, there's kind of the structural assumption that you have an inner and outer dimension to your array structure, which is a, uh, which if you think about in terms of that original bijection e mapping between nats and tuples of nats, as you kind of raised, that's kind of a, a weird thing if you have tiling or things that don't look like row major or column major. Um, and so this raises some cool stuff I can talk about later. Um, you have, so you're slicing, so you have a row major matrix, you can pick out a sub range of rows, you can pick out a row, uh, you can sort of, or you can do sort of these more general things that just destroy locality. Um, so I have a buffer, and it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Not, uh, I said, ten. anyways, um, we can count. Uh, and then you have some sort of mapping from your coordinate space of like three by three, to that buffer representation. So let's think about in terms of like some op how it maps to that buffer and that sort of lattice definition that I kind of laid out before. Um, so let's use column major because I can reach it. Uh, so I can pick out a column, and it'll be a continuous run uh, in the underlying memory buffer. If I pick out a row, I have to skip along. It's a regular stride, so it's strided. So that means that picking a row in a column major matrix induces a stridedness, whereas picking a column preserves whatever locality we had to begin with. Um, I can also pick out a range of columns, and that'll still be a continuous 
a contiguous chunk of the underlying address book. Um, I can do a slice and say, pick out this guy. And this will become, in that lattice of vocabulary, intercontiguous, because I have five and six being next to each other, and then eight and nine being next to each other. Um, if I said, oh, I want to pick every odd row and every odd column, ignoring whether we're zero and one index, I could be like, oh, uh, I want this, this, and this, and this. And then that becomes a strided slice in general. So I, kind of, I, mean, I, so I just walked through a few basic, basic examples visually of how we have different natural selection op operations we're doing on these arrays. Are you okay? Oh, okay. Yeah, do you have a question? No. no, no. Okay. Um, and how they relate to that lattice of information. Okay. Well, so I just, this is me just repeating. So repeat it again. When we're slicing a range of rows in a row major matrix, or a range of columns in a column major matrix, whatever locality we had going in, we get out. Uh, so this is me kind of running that abstract interpretation process. Um, if I sort of say, oh, I want this sub sub chunk of that matrix, like I was saying, pick the, just to pick the part described by here and here. Um, that sort of is in inducing this notion that I call that is uh, that is in between stride and contiguous that I'm calling intercontiguous. Um, interestingly, the original motivation I had for dealing with the notion of intercontiguous was so I could actually distinguish between the classes of arrays you could invoke using BLAST and other Fortran libraries versus not, because a lot of these Fortran libraries don't allow you to work with stri like strided views of a matrix. And in general, when I do this potentially strided slice on a on an interior dimension that is a rank reduction in the array, or um, or a stride slice. Um, it goes to stride. So there's sort of like this, so this is where the, this is a lattice that's just big enough that you can see that there's like a min operator for a, uh, in the, where you wind up either um, at whatever point you're at before or you get brought down to this point in the middle of the lattice. Um, okay, so this is something I'll get to, I can talk, of, I can walk through some example documentation and whatnot, but actually splitting up my, decomposing these array operations this way Actually results, just check, uh, actually results in some really really nice generality, um, and involving I can actually give uh, a good a uniform API for the good locality slices that also works with sparse matrices. That is, I can use the same slicing API and infra infrastructure to actually work write the same code that will work correctly for not just dense row and dense column major but also for corresponding sparse versions of those formats, um, which you cannot do if you are distinct, if you have just a generalized slice indexing tuple kind of notation, um, because uh, you can't efficient, you, can't, you have to basically do a deep copy if you wanna pick a column out of a row major sparse structure. Um, let's see. So, I, this, I was pr very much simplifying over you know, more precise uh, models of locality, but those are models of locality that I can't actually easily communicate by talking with someone for five minutes. Um, I don't think pe most people remember that you have like 16 general purpose pointer registers and a similar number of SIMD registers on most modern x86 64-bit architectures, or that you have, you know, 32 kilobytes of L1 data cache, 32 kilobytes of instruction cache, which is why you want to be careful about inlining, and then you have 256 kilobytes of L2 cache, and then about 1.5 megabytes of L3 cache multiplied by the number of cores you have, possibly with more if you have a NUMA architecture involving how they synchronize stuff. None of you are going to remember that unless you already kind of knew that. Uh, you might remember the lattice vocabulary laid out before as this nice qualitative way of thinking about it. You're not going to remember precise cost model information. Um, it gets worse. Um, when you get into like how you engineer matrix multiply or factorization, you have these very intricate uh, nested alternating inner outer product structures that are designed to exploit all that hierarchical structure. But 
it's very hard to understand that without going to read some papers for a while, because the library, the languages you're writing these in, C or Fortran, whatever, do not give you any way of decomposing which operations have good locality preservation characteristics uh, as part of the API. Because, oh, we have array annotation, it's efficient. No, it isn't. <laughs> um, just because you have array notation doesn't make it fast. Um, and just because you have a language with procedures doesn't mean you implemented tail calls correctly. Um, I mean, there's also like a deep cultural issue in, in the numerical computing community where um, because they're used to Python and even shittier languages, um, they think recursion is expensive, so they wind up writing these sort of recursive decompositions as like these really fiddly nested loops. So it becomes even harder <coughs> to like have it be tractable to understand what's going on here because it's just lost in the weeds. Um, and you know, and even this is a little bit crazy because what's going on internally, I did, forgot, did I misgenerate the last slide? Let me pull up the picture anyways. I have a pretty picture to show you. Um, Okay, so <laughs> who wants to like use to like reverse engineer some thirty-year-old Fortran code that has some conditional compilation that chooses based upon the indicated CPU architecture what size to block things at? Are you going to be able to understand that code? Are you going to be able to educate someone else how to use that code? There's a tension between sort of having you you can't really prove performance. You can just measure it. Or, or provide tools to help explain and understand why. Um, I cannot help anyone learn how to write performance code by showing them this. This will not work. Um, I need to give them a good, faithful approximation rules of thumb set of ideas that I can bake into the tools I give them so they can just discover and use a vocabulary that's baked into the library I give them. Um, you know, so so, um, and, but but a real but to revisit going back to something I was saying earlier, because I have a little bit more time. Um, one thing that was really fascinating for me is let me just pull up the actual haddocks for this code. Uh, okay, I need to use Chrome. I don't have the URL correctly there. Uh, Never mind. Uh, that was not. Okay, fine. Uh, yeah, that works. Um, let's see. Measure measure the latency to Virginia. Um, okay, so a few other really really cool things come out um, of doing this work. One is you. Can you Actually, the font size, please. Okay, sure. Okay, there's a lot of type machinery going on. We don't need it for designing APIs, but sometimes it's good to bake it in. Although for a lot of this index stuff, I'll probably wind up writing a version that hides that information, so pe people just getting started don't have to think about it. But one thing that was really surprising that I wound up needing to do is I need to actually abstract over the notion of an array address. This was really surprising for me. But it actually is really crucial to be able to give the right complexity for operations that I want to work correctly, both for sparse data structures and for um, dense data structures. And this relates to how you might do so. Uh, and and hmm, I can talk about this later with anyone because I'm around all week. Um, let's let's uh, let's do some questions, even though I think we have a little bit more too much time for questions. So, anyone have questions? They can be really confused questions. Could you show us maybe somewhere in the haddock, somewhere where you talked about, um, somewhere that captures um, this notion of oh. like operations that have different, um, okay, yes, yes, different okay. striding and how that would be reflected in the types? Okay, so this. Um, uh, this rectil rectilinear array class. Um, so the idea, so the idea is, to actually talk about slicing, you need to assume that there's sort of some sort of notion of ordering on your dimensions. Um, and 
So let's just zoom in a little bit more so I can. So it's these three operations. You, the idea, and, and I'm not even giving the bad locality one in my initial release of this library because I haven't seen any motivated use of it, at least for 2D arrays. Um, so the idea, so uh, it winds up being that slicing on the outermost dimension just preserves whatever locality structure my input array data type had. Um, when I project on the outermost dimension, it, pre it decreases the rank of the structure, but it doesn't change locality. But when I do a slice, I have an associated type function that will, if it is a type indexed array, it'll actually adjust the locality rep index of that type to reflect uh, that it was transformed to being uh, intercontiguous or, or was already worse than that. Uh, uh, which one is that? Uh, mutable, yeah, there's a, this is why I didn't use types in the, the, in the slides, because you get lost in the weeds. Um, but the basic idea is you have a mutable array, and you give sort of the min and max coordinate tuple for the range you're selecting out. And this is sort of just doing that lattice min operation, but in a way where I'm not assuming that I have a type index structure. So, even, so I'm using the type families to hide that the type class interface even, ha even can have that index structure. So I can give a simplified version of my array types that existentially wrap up or hide what the locality quality is. One, really, one, one thing is actually reflecting this up in the types um, results in some other interesting problems. Like if you're reflecting locality structure into arrays, well, every time you build an array, it's contiguous. Um, but so I can't call fmap on a strided or intercontiguous array. At least the normal fmap, uh, uh, assuming I had a like a parametric underlying representation that allows any type. Um, so you wind up having this thing where I have to be a type class to distinguish when I might even be allocating things, because I ha when I'm allocating things, they always have good locality, like as in terms of the model of the underlying buffer. Um, so I can't define sort of a a properly parametric looking fmap operation unless I hide that locality structure. So it's also a case where if you, it, it's, it sort of is just on the cusp of enriching the types too much actually makes you lose certain generics. Uh, one thing that a lot of people sometimes ask me about is why don't you have statically size things instead of just the rank? And then recursion looks too scary. Is, is the simple answer. Um, I think it's valuable for like, as someone in the back was asking, tiled representations of, for like the inner part, like where you have an array made of little static size dense arrays. And being able to compose these nested, nested formats like that, having these interior matrix components be statically sized is valuable in that context. But it sucks for end usability with respect to encouraging recursion. Just, it sucks. Um, and additionally, you wind up in general, if you're dynamically loading your array information, you have to, di you have to do this explicit, do the dimensions match existential, which is the same as just dynamically type check, checking it anyway, so why not just do that? Um, more questions? So possibly naive questions. That's so, good. It means so, I, can, I might learn something. So I've got, got a bunch of code, and I run an abstract interpretation on it. It might do something like tell me, your code looks fast to me, or no, so this looks like it might be slow, but when I bake it into the type system, all the type system can, can do is say tick or X. Well, I want so, it doesn't talk. So, the, so notice here, I'm not actually really restricting how, what locality operations can have. Um, it's important to note that what I was describing earlier is a semi-algorithm. You will never give it to a computer and get something. It's still a creative process. It just gives you a structured way of thinking about Given a basic general a a purpose API as a starting point that people use in a given domain, and a cost model for that domain, how can I transform it into one where I don't have to look at the internal implementation details of those operations? That is, I'd like my primitives to be path insensitive in what their costs are. So what the type system is giving you is it's guaranteeing that we're not lying to people about the cost model implications of the implementation. Of the no, no, it, it's actually I don't. It's not guaranteeing anything. It's giving you syntactic auditability. It is you can go back and understand what was happening and where it might be slow. You can write inter in operations that might only have allow good locality arrays, but then you're just going to be writing lots of allocation-heavy code 
to work around that interface restriction. Let me ask my question in a different, I mean, that makes sense to me, but I'm... No, you're asking a reasonable question. Let me ask it in a slightly different way. Yeah. So suppose I have this list of operations with sort of the types as you have them, yeah. and I have the corresponding list of operations with sort of really naive sort of array types. Mm -hmm. so what code could I write that would type check with the Both. naive array code and wouldn't type check? No, no, no. It's, it's, saying it, it, it's it makes no the type system here is there. not for correctness, it's for auditability is a key thing. I am you, that is, I can, for the type classes as I gave them here, I can actually give you a non-indexed version of these operations as a legal instance. That, because the idea is, it's making it syntactically auditable to identify where you're doing operations that are disrupting memory locality. So another way to say that is, I could write an algorithm and have no types, like no explicit type annotations, and I ask GHCI, What's the type of this? And it would tell me sort of the bound on how bad my locality was. Yeah, um, of course, the, the or at least it'll show you oh, what rough. The, it'll show you what the joins you're doing. Yeah, on, or the the mens are. So, so one more question is: uh, suppose I'm implementing. Sounds a place. Okay, so suppose I'm like implementing say matrix addition. Okay. I write a plus b plus c, mm -hmm. and if, like you know, in something like MATLAB or uh, NumPy, it's going to allocate an intermediate matrix. And so, so, well, okay, there's a deeper issue with NumPy even mm -hmm. for a slightly related problem, which is NumPy does not actually, it, 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 oh, basically, anytime it can't invoke BLAST or LAPAC, it'll just do a deep copy to transform it into the format it, that does support that. So that is, NumPy silently does a deep copy if you're doing a matrix vector product or matrix matrix product where one of those matrices is a two stride on the innermost dimension. Um, whereas like using this sort of vocabulary, I can give two different blast wrappers. One where I only have instances for uh, my con contiguous and intercontinuous <coughs> formats that are have applicable blast analogs. And another that does a deep copy. Can you in any way track aliasing information? Uh, yeah, that's what I was getting at. Oh, um, so not with what I've done. Nothing precludes that, but the way that I would probably do that to have a good user experience is have this sort of be the language that the query planner kind of executes rather than what you might write as your query to speak a little bit metaphorically. Um, I've spoken with some people about ideas along those lines, um, but you kind of need to have a foundation you can trust it if you're admitting that but this at least gives me a nice way of understand capturing a lot of the basic structure. It doesn't, so another way of thinking about this is I only capture sort of good locality idioms that correspond to with say level one, level two blasts where you're just sort of doing a single scan kind of thing. It does let me sort of think about how to structure things like matrix matrix product in terms of operations that don't bump me over to being fully strided. But I still have to do the right cache aware block decomposition recursively or whatnot. Um, and uh, there's a lot of, and then also bottoming out to the right kernel of like making sure I'm saturating the CPU's instruction ports uh, or something like that. Um, I was wondering if you could give me a little bit of an idea of how much more complex this makes an API. Am I it makes it simpler. Um, because um, a lot of standard APIs for problem domains Bake in a lot of assumptions about the cost model or not and just punning things together. By actually forcing me to be explicit about what the different path sensitivities, sensitivities sensitive, sensitive, making every, decomposing everything into these path insensitive components that don't have like different corner case logic internally, I'm forced to write down what my structural assumptions are to provide different operations. Um, my slicing structure requ it is require, requires actually being able to talk about having rows or columns. I can't use that with like a Hilbert curve or Morden order, and I can generalize it slightly to support doing tile, rows of tiles or whatnot. But basically, breaking up this way, at least internally, when you're thinking about an API, forces you to, in a very structured mechanical way, think about the structural assumptions every operation has internally and different ways of implementing it. Because that generic looking operation might be just totally rebuilding what it's doing underneath under some of these paths. And that's blowing up the complexity for everything else. 
Um, notice how here I don't give the strided project or strided slice operation. I mentioned I only implement uh, projecting or slicing on the outermost dimension or sort of doing this min and max coordinate range kind of thing. Those are operations I can efficiently per implement for sparse matrices. Um, I can't do a strided project or, or slice for sparse matrices. So this actually gives me a way of decomposing my array operations in a way where I actually can make the default APIs sparse friendly by default as well as working for depths. Um, more of a remark than a question, but maybe you can say yes or no to the remark, whether you agree or disagree. So to bring this back to effects, um, it seems like you have this, it's, it's like an effect system for looking at how you use memory resources. And GHC has got so much cool stuff that we can embed analysis into the types. Is that yeah. a sort of essentially well, what's going on? It, it kind of is. I'm just doing a, type of applying a function to the type index and doing yeah. something yeah. and defining a way where I can extend it. Um, but I don't think that was the hard part or the interesting part. Um, it's how do you make it easy to reason about how you expect the constant factors to work out for things. I mean, you can kind of use these ideas to give to define a partial order between programs that have equivalent complexity, as like a as a heuristic for saying this one is definitely faster or definitely slower or it's unclear because these two things differ. That's not something I've explored, and I've not really explored what happens when you sort of mechanize these uh, rules of thumb model and then sort of do actually do an abstract interpretation. That's just me trying to synthesize what the design ideas themselves were. Um, but it could be done. I'm not going to do it. Someone else could if they wanted to. Um, I'm not going to scoop them. They have too much other shit. Um, but and the point being is there's a lot of really cool problem domains where um, for the point programming programming language research is to make it easier to synthesize and compose tools for solving those problems. And this is uh, I, there's a lot of really cool ideas that pop out of forcing yourself to write down what your structural assumptions are for every operation and trying to make sure they don't have any corner cases by just removing the corner cases. Because um, everyone loves corner cases, right? Uh, okay, I, I think we're... Yeah, yeah, cool. So let's thank the speaker. Uh, whose dongle is this? Uh,